thank you, Damir. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you about some open questions on uh, based on joint work we have with Serge Grigoriev and with Ted Sleiman. Unfortunately, none of them can be uh, here uh, now during the talk, but uh, uh, well, here we are. How do I, uh, here. This re um, research started with a wanted theorem. We know that computability theory has a notion of randomness, um, for real numbers, and the theory of uniform distribution has a notion of equidistribution for sequences of real numbers. We wanted a theorem like the one on the screen. A real number x is random if and only if something about a sequence uh, associated to x is uniformly distributed in the unit interval. And we wanted to find this theorem. I, somehow it's not uh, working. I will do this. Well, um, I think you're looking too much of my screen. Um, let's do like this. Uh, Let's start with the definition of randomness in computability theory that I assume all of us know. Um, a real number is random in computability theory if it has no exceptional properties. And Martin Love was the first one to formalize this as saying a real number is random if it avoids every effective G delta null set. Formally is a real X is random if for every uniformly computable sequence of open sets that have a Lebesgue measure uh, bounded uh, by a computable function converging to zero, we ask that X does not belong to the intersection of these open sets. And by asking that the measure is computable, we obtain a definition that uh, makes more uh, random reals and we call it Schnorr random due to, um, the definition is due to Schnorr. Uh, this definition entails that almost all real numbers with respect to Lebesgue measure are random because they are just countably many um, uniformly computable sequence of open sets. Um, this definition, we say it is robust because there is another formulation that uh, turned out to be equivalent in terms of Kolmogorov complexity and some other uh, equivalent definitions as well. Examples of uh, random numbers uh, for instance, are the omega numbers the holding probabilities of universal Turing machines. And along the talk, I will talk about random numbers by thinking all the time of Martin Love random for this definition. Um, the theory of uniform distribution has a classical uh, definition that says that the sequence of real numbers x1, x2, x3 is uniformly distributed in the unit interval if for every interval a b uh, in the unit interval it happens that uh, the proportion of elements in the sequence that are in the set a b in the limit goes to the length of the interval b minus a along the talk i will use these braces along a real number to denote the fractional expansion so when i put brace x brace means fractional expansion of x, x minus the integer part of x, or the, identically it will be x modulo one. And for instance, a convergent sequence is not uniformly distributed modulo one. The definition is robust. There are many equivalent formulations. For instance, for every continuous function from the real numbers to the complex numbers with period one, uh, the sequence is uniformly distributed when the average value of the function uh, along the sequence converges to the integral or with bias criteria that says that this exponential sum in the limit goes to zero. We will not get into um, the uh, equivalent formulations, but this is just to recall that these are very robust notions. So to marry the notion coming from computability theory and the notion coming from 
uh, the theory of uni uniform distribution, number theory, it was very appealing for us. Um, this uh, notion of uniform distribution has a nice theorem by Lavka that says that if you consider the Lebesgue measure mu on the unit interval and you take the product measure for the sequences of real numbers, then, and you call it mu infinity, we will mention this um, product measure a couple of times along the talk, we have that mu almost all sequences of uh, real numbers are uniformly distributed in the unit interval. There are two um, theorems that were uh, motivating us to uh, find this wanted theorem. The first is a classical one by Ball, Sierpinski and Weil, 1909-1910, independently proved that a real number X is irrational exactly when the sequence n times x, namely x, 2x, 3x, 4x, and so on, is uniformly mod distributed modulo one. Another theorem for this other one, I need to recall Borel's definition of a normal number. And more than 100 years ago, Borel gave the following definition. He said, a real number uh, is normal to a given base, if in the fractional expansion of this number written in base in that base, each digit occurs the same number of times in the limit as each other, any other digit, and each block of digits appears the same with the same frequency as any other block of the same length. Um, that definition, combinatorial definition, um, can be characterized by this theorem of Wall 1949. A real number X is normal to base B, integer base B, if and only if the sequence X, B, X, B square X, B to the third X, etc., is uniformly distributed modulo one. So with these two theorems in mind, we wanted a theorem, a real X is random if and only if something, some sequence uh, talking about X is UD mod one. We went back to a 1935 Dutch mathematician, Kuxma, who came up with a class of sequences um, from the unit interval to the real numbers that are is a, a sequences of functions. And these functions, each of them is continuously differentiable. And there is a property about the derivative that we should not get into, but I will only make an example and tell you what they are about. These examples are sequences in the class. This, the class uh, of the sequences of functions x going to n times x for all possible values of n is in the class. The sequence x going to a n x for different integers a n is in the class. x going to two to the n times x is also in the class. x going to x to the n for different values of n is not in the class. Why? It fails the last condition on derivatives that says that the difference between the derivatives has to be greater than a constant. And this will fail. And the last uh, is a map that uh, makes a translation. X going to X times N times A for a value A, say a rational value A, is not uh, in, in the class uh, because again, it fails the last condition. So it fails that the difference in derivatives is going to be greater than a positive constant. So it will not be positive. It will be zero in both cases, zero minus zero, no. So he gave this definition, as I said, does not really matter now to enter into. The definition comes really, uh, it is exactly what he needed to prove this nice theorem. It says, if you get a sequence of functions in the class, u1, u2, u3, and then it, it's a metric result. For almost all real numbers, um, the sequence u1x, u2x, u3x, etc., is uniformly distributed modu modulo one. 
So we thought that perhaps our, our wanted theorem may be something along these lines. Well, year 2013, actually, uh, Avigat gave a theorem along those lines that strengthens on the one side and uh, weakens on the other side. So instead of giving a metric result, he gave a result for all Schnorr random reals. Says if X is Schnorr random, then for every computable sequence AN of distinct integers, the sequence A1X, A2X, A3X, and so on is uniformly distributed modulo one. So uh, he got rid of the almost all, uh, but the class of sequences he used was one particular class of sequences that were contemplated by uh, Coxma class. What did we do? Well, we effectivized the um, Coxma class. We call it uh, effective Coxma class. And by making these uh, sequences of uh, functions being computable and with computable derivative, and we could prove that uh, a strengthening of Avigad theorem, if X is a real number in the unit interval that is Schnorr random, th then for every sequence, A1, A2, U1, U2, et cetera, in the effective Coxma class, it happens that the, val the sequence of values U1 of X, U2 of X, U3 of X, and so on, it's uniformly distributed module one. So we had it. Um, is this enough uh, to arrive to a characterization? No. The reverse of Avigad theorem fails and the um, argument uh, was um, raised uh, in uh, the algorithmic randomness workshop at the American Institute of Math last August, 2020. Uh, this is, was a, a workshop organized by Hirschfeld, Millet, Ryman and Sleiman. Um, and they uh, formalize the argument that they are not, they are non-random reals uh, such that for every computable sequence of distinct integers A1, A2, A3, uh, the sequence A1X, A2X, A3X, et cetera, is uniformly distributed module one. So it's not necessary to be <laughs> Um, it's not random to satisfy this. The counterexample constructed a pi zero one class, of course, of Lebesgue measure zero, but of Fourier dimension one. So from there, they conjecture the following that is still uh, to be proved uh, that if a, a real number x is random for a measure of positive Fourier dimension, so you don't need to be dimension one positive Fourier dimension, then the sequence uh, thought by Avigad, A1x, A2x, A3x, for any computable sequence of distinct integers is going to be UD mod one. So this will uh, is the first uh, open question I'm raising here. Uh, at the end of the talk, I will make a summary of open questions, but this is, it has the form of a conjecture made by some other people, not me. Uh, so what did we do? Since the converse of uh, the, the reverse of our proposed uh, theorem failed to give the characterization, we came up with a stronger notion and we call it sigma zero one UD mod one. A sequence of real numbers is sigma zero one U D mod one, if for every recursively enumerable set in the reals, call it A, it happens that uh, the proportion of elements of the sequence that are in the set A in the limit coincides with the measure. When I say the, the elements in the set, we have to take the fractional parts of the elements in the set because the set is set of in the real numbers in the unit interval. And, and the sequence is just of reals. So you get rid of the integer part. Uh, with this definition, the first thing we did is to prove that in fact, using our product measure mu infinity, we show that almost all sequences of real numbers in the unit interval are sigma zero one UD. 
it's uh, easy to see that uh, if you have a computable and irrational number, then the sequence x, if x is a computable and irrational number, the sequence x, 2x, 3x, and so on, so n times x is ud mod 1, but not sigma 0, 1 ud mod 1, because you can construct the set A such that each um, shift, uh, or each element of the sequence n times x goes into the set. So uh, this seemed to be a candidate for us. And indeed, we proved with Serge Grigoriev that if you have a real number in the unit interval and you have a sequence uh, u1, u2, u3 in the effective Coxma class, then the sequence made by the values of applying uh, u1 of x, u2 of x, u3 of x is, it happens as sigma 0, 1, u d mod 1, then you can conclude that x is Martin Lofgren. So, uh, what about the converse? So does the reverse hold? Is this a characterization? To our surprise, <laughs> some years before our theorem, um, two groups of colleagues, uh, Franklin Greenberg, Miller, and Ng, on the one hand, and Bienvenue, they, Haurup, Mezirov, and Shen, uh, worked on a, an effective version of Birkhoff ergodic theorem that allows to characterize martin love randomness. It follows in a way that I will explain in a minute that from their theorem that a real X is random exactly when the sequence two to the N times X is sigma zero one with D mod one. So using our notion of uniform distribution, not with respect to intervals, but with respect to recursively enumerable sets, then we can characterize or they characterize already randomness. So still, as I will explain, there are some questions on uh, how the notions calibrate, but uh, here is uh, how this theorem comes into play. Their effective version of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem uh, says the following. If you start with a computable probability space X and you have a computable ergodic map, let's call it T, a point X in the space is Martin Love random exactly when for every effectively closed subset of the space, the average, um, the, the proportion of elements uh, of the iteration of the ergodic map that are in the set U uh, in the limit goes to the measure of U. Now, if uh, instead of uh, thinking of a, an arbitrary uh, ergodic uh, computable map as for instance, the shift in the Cantor space, you think of uh, the multiplication by two on the reals, you obtain exactly the um, behavior uh, of the, the theorem I mentioned. A point X is random exactly when the sequence of iterations on the point uh, is sigma zero one UD because uh, what you have for effectively closed subsets, you also have it for the complement. So you have it for the open sets and you obtain the um, needed uh, uniform distribution for from exactly the counting of how many times uh, the elements go into the set. So it coincides with our definition uh, exactly. So that's how uh, from their effective version of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, uh, we obtain, um, I will go back and uh, the theorem I mentioned. So we have this um, notion that characterizes a martin love random number and the notion of uniform distribution modulo one for sigma zero one sets. However, um, iterations on ergodic maps, computable ergodic maps, and the effective Coxma class do not coincide exactly. Although the definition uh, of ergodic map that uh, multiplies by two uh, on the 
uh, real numbers in the unit interval is ergodic and the sequence x going to 2 to the n times x is in the effective Coxma class? Yes. So we have some uh, instances that belong to iterations of ergodic math and effective Coxma class. However, as I anticipated some slides before, translations um, are ergodic, but they are not in the effective Coxma class. So the map X going to X plus A um, is ergodic when A is irrational, but X going to X plus N times A in, is not in the effective Coxma class. So um, the theorems, um, the theorem we had in mind uh, still uh, is open. We don't know whether it coincides to consider. So this is a, a, the actual question, the first question on, on my research that is still open, that uh, uh, we don't know whether our the theorem characterizing randomness and sigma 0, 1 UD for um, the sequence 2 to the n times x coincides with, with the existence of one sequence in the effective Coxma class such that uh, un of x uh, is sigma 0, 1 ug mod 1. And we also don't know whether it coincides with asking that for all sequences in the effective Coxma class, um, we, we ask that is sigma 0, 1 ug. On the other hand, uh, by uh, looking on this Avigad result, or this by Avigad, Avigad proved that if you start with a sequence of computable a n inter integers distinct, uh, the sequence a n a n times x is uniformly distributed modulo one. Uh, we do not know whether asking that property is the same as asking that uh, uniform distribution for all the sequences in the effective Coxma class. We believe this is uh, painted in pink with uh, a slash on top because we believe they are not the same, but still not proved. So this will be uh, the first question. Now I will move to another uh, classical definition coming from uniform distribution. It gives a quantitative um, definition for uniform distribution and it's called the discrepancy of a sequence of real numbers. If you take a finite sequence of capital N many elements, um, you define the discrepancy for them uh, as say for a given interval, let's call the interval UV in the, um, and this is the discrepancy for one given interval uh, among the first N, L, capital N many elements of the sequence is you, take the proportion of elements uh, or in the sequence that are in the set. And uh, this is Xi is the indicator function. So you get that, that proportion of elements in the set and you uh, compare it with the size of the set. So V minus U, the length of the interval, and you take the absolute value. And that's the discrepancy for one interval. If you take the supremum over all possible intervals, you obtain the discrepancy associated to the first capital N many elements of the sequence. And the definition of uniform distribution for a sequence X1, X2, X3 of different reals is that of being that the limit of the discrepancy for the number of elements going to infinity goes to zero in that case we have uniform distribution module one. Now, there's a very deep uh, result saying that discrepancy for uh, any sequence, so no sequence can have discrepancy zero. Discrepancy necessarily is uh, bigger than, among the first n elements necessarily, it's bigger than log n over n infinitely many times. So infinitely many positions of your sequence will have discrepancy greater than log n over n. And in fact, this is a deep theorem because it's this lower bound obtained by Boltzmann Schmidt is achieved by some sequences, van der Korput sequences. It, it's nice to know that if you, by taking one particular real number as opposed to different real numbers, you can uh, 
construct a sequence of a form two to the n times x having a discrepancy below almost this optimal discrepancy given by Schmidt. It is the discrepancy of log n squared over n as opposed to log n over n. Uh, and this is for this kind of sequences only for two to the n times x. Now um, you can wonder if by your selected uh, uh, real number x, what happens with all the other sequences Two, instead of two to the n times x, you put three to the n, uh, five to the n, six to the n, all um, integers uh, that are multiplicatively independent between each other, pairwise multiplicatively independent. And you have now lots of sequences. Can you obtain this low discrepancy at the same time? Uh, some work we did together with Christoph Eisleitner, uh, Adrian Maria Schirer and, and Ted Sleiman is that we constructed a real number computable with the least possible discrepancy we could obtain simultaneously for all bases at the same time. But it is unknown whether you can make something um, with smaller discrepancy. It, it, we don't know. What we do know, and this is a sequence of theorems starting in 1964 by Galag Gal, who were co-authors of Paul Erdos, that his, they found that if a metric result, almost all real numbers are such that uh, if you take the sequence two to the m times x, the discrepancy associated to them is bounded by the law of iterated logarithm. And this upper bound is reached for infinitely many positions n. So this is saying that uh, having low discrepancy is an exceptional property. So one here is question, open question two. What is the discrepancy associated to the sequence two to the n times x when x is a random real? I imagine a theorem like this metric theorem put on the slide that's saying if X is Martin Love random, then this statement about the discrepancy holds, namely discrepancy is below that uh, quantity and it is rich of that quantity for infinitely many positions N. Uh, I, so I think uh, no metric result, but a, 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 a definite result for all random reals is waiting for us to give that result, still to be proved. If what I said is false, then the question is open. What is the discrepancy associated to random reals? Are all possible discrepancies available uh, for random reals or not? Just jumping in, since you said that we could do that. Um, See, the, this constant C, is there anything interesting to be said about that? I'm, uh, I, I'm quite so, so surprised that the C doesn't depend on, on X. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, C depends not on X, depends on the two. So really, uh, I made it very simple in the slide, but here you have three results, Gal and Gal. Philip and Fukuyama. So Fukuyama actually gave the actual C for each possible kind of sequence. If you put a two, you have a one C. If you put a three, you have another C. If you put, instead of an integer, you put some other uh, value uh, between greater than one, uh, still you have another sequence kind of lacunary sequences are called and you have another C. So he made a, a full study on how the uh, constant changes. Uh, and as it says here, this upper bound is rich for infinitely many ends. So really the constant matters for that result too, uh, because you really want to show that it is rich exactly. Um, does it answer your question? Um, partially, I'm, I'm then wondering, is this C sort of just some complex ex 
expression, some rational number? Is it at least case that CC is co computable or? Yes, it is computable. It is very nice. Uh, I in this um, I have in one paper I copy it, but also in this uh, presentation at the end there is all the uh, references for this book, and you will see the paper by Fukuyama um, that uh, has a list. <laughs> it's very interesting. It puts a list of uh, all these uh, um, constants. Okay, thanks. Uh, it is a very explicit um, work. Uh, I found that this uh, area of number theory, um, there, there is one particular way of doing this, that they uh, get a lot of effort, they put a lot of effort in finding all the constants. And they don't put, there is a constant, they actually give it uh, most of the times. So it happens like that. Uh, and this is a case for this work. Not in the work of Galangal. In Galangal, first thing, not all the constants are given, but yes, in Fukuyama. And um, now I would like to go to a new result uh, by Ted Sleiman, um, who uh, proved the following. He said, if a real number is real is random but with respect to a non-trivial Fourier measure, not a random for Lebesgue measure, but for a, a Fourier measure, then he proved that for all integers B, the sequence B to the n times X is UG mod one. And moreover, there will be a linear bound on its Kolmogorov complexity. So the question here is, well, let's try to give a quantitative version of uh, his theorem by showing exactly what is the classical discrepancy, which is this discrepancy is taken with respect to Lebesgue measure. But uh, the discrepancy of this sequence may, of course, go to zero because, as we know, b to the n times x is, by his theorem, un uniformly distributed modulo one. But at what speed does it go? So we would like to give a quantitative aspect for his theorem. Uh, and I think uh, the connection between Fourier uh, measures and discrepancy is um, a full area uh, to be studied. Uh, because what I found is that this classic, well, many of the classical uh, theorems in the theory of uniform distribution are not effectivized yet. By their using effectivization, we come into play. <laughs> Our work on computability comes into play and allows us to connect with uh, random reals. Well, our notion of randomness, sorry. Now I would like to um, present to you a definition that um, you, I, most probably you have not listened before. Uh, it is still unpublished work by Yuval Perez and Benjamin Weiss, although they came up with this definition some time ago, many years ago. Um, it's called the definition of a Poisson generic real. First, let's recall something you possibly know from a long time ago, but you have not been using lately, which is where the uh, Poisson law comes from. Uh, it is uh, a con convergence uh, from the binomial distribution when you take the sample size going to infinity. So let's start very, I will not go into deep this, but to recall where these numbers come from. If you suppose an event X has probability P, lowercase p, the probability of having exactly K occurrences of the event X in N independent draws is the binomial N time N K times the probability P uh, to the K times the probability one minus P to the N minus K. Now, uh, if we put a parameter lambda, for now it will be maybe very convenient to think lambda equals one, then we can, but important is lambda being positive. Um, 
And then we can think of the probability being lambda over n. If lambda equals one, it will be probability one over n. So if your sample size is capital N, the probability be, would be one over n. Then what happens if you fix this k occurrences, um, you fix k and you take the limit on the sample size going to infinity and the probability being lambda over n, maybe one over n. Then you take the limit of this uh, binomial um, distribution thing and what you obtain is exactly the, what is expected by the Poisson law, e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k over k factorial. So for each k, you have one of these values and it, uh, it holds that if you take the sum of these values over all possible k's, you obtain one as expected, which will be the probability of all uh, the cases uh, together. So this is our number, uh, this expression e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k, k factorial. And now we are able to define Poisson generic reals. And it, what do they come into play? Or what do they say? For Borel normality, I mentioned that we count the number of occurrences of each digit and we compare it with the number of occurrences of each other digit. And we also compare the number of occurrences of each block of digits and we compare it with the number of occurrences of every, of every other block of the same length. Here, instead of doing that, we are going to only count occurrences of blocks, yes, but not an, at any position whatsoever, but at positions that are exponentially far away, two to the n, two to the n plus one, two to the n plus two. And in, what we are going to do is we say, okay, let's see how many, so we are sitting in the first two to the n many bits, uh, we are going to do it in base two. So we are sitting in the first two to the n many bits and we are going to count how many blocks of length n do not appear at all. We are not going to ask for digits, only for blocks of length n. Then how many blocks of length n appear exactly once? How many blocks of length n appear twice? And so on. So the definition being clear, uh, actually the lambda comes into play uh, and it says, if you take an initial seg segment of length capital N, where capital N will be the integer part of lambda times two to the lowercase n, uh, and you think of this initial segment as N capital N independent draws of words of length N, then you can think of the probability P being lambda over N, which is essentially one over two to the N. So namely, you have one over two to the N um, possibilities of getting a block of length N. It makes sense. The definition of a binary sequence being Poisson generic says that for all possible parameters lambda and for all integers K, zero, one, two, it should happen that when you take the first lambda times two to the n many symbols of your sequence, the number of blocks of length n occurring exactly k times divided the number of the total number of words of blocks of length n, which is two to the n, has to go to the Poisson uh, value that we studied before. So it's really counting how many words of length n do not occur at all in the first two to the n many symbols, how many words of length n occur exactly once, how many words of length n occur exactly three times, and it compares with the expected value. If it fits this expected value given by the Poisson law, then it is Poisson generic. Perez and Weiss proved that almost all real numbers um, are Poisson generic and that uh, uh, the, this definition entails or implies Borel normality. However, <laughs> it seems that we are starting again with all the story that happened for Borel normal numbers. There are no examples known. Champernon sequence is not Poisson genetic. That's not hard to see. It happens that when you count how many blocks do not occur, uh, it does not coincide with what is expected. 
So here are the two obvious questions to ask. Is there a computable Poisson genetic real? This opens a uh, work analog to uh, the work started by Alan Turing in 1937, who uh, gave an algorithm to compute uh, an absolutely normal number. Here we are, I'm thinking, can we make a construction, a computable construction to give rise to a, a real number that is Poisson genetic? What Turing did is to incrementally construct initial segments that extending the initial segment so that it avoids a null set. Why a null set? Because we know that almost all real numbers have the property, the complement, so are the numbers who do not have the property, and those are in a set of measure zero. So the construction should be such that um, each extension still avoids this measure zero set. And it is always possible to continue. For the work on normal numbers, a lot has been done, uh, starting with Turing on these computable constructions, but many of our colleagues uh, already, uh, including myself, we have came up with different algorithms, and now there are algorithms that run even in linear time. This is Lutz, Jack Lutz and Elvira Mayordomo have a linear time algorithm to compute an absolutely normal number. Now we would like uh, well, first being a computable person, genetic real, and perhaps we are lucky and we can follow the kind of research already done for Borel normality and obtain uh, a Poisson genetic computable real in um, computable time that is linear or, or polynomial um, to produce n digits of it. We just use polynomial in many, many uh, steps that would be very nice. Another problem is, uh, well, this metric uh, theorem by Perez and Weiss uh, that says almost all reals are Poisson generic. Is it true that all Martin Love random reals are Poisson generic? I expect to be yes, but still we need a proof. What do we need to prove that? Well, we need to effectivize um, Perez and Weiss proof, it is highly non-effective. So it uses arguments, um, but it's not uh, constructive at all. It's not a kind of Martin Love test. Now I will- a question? Move. Yes, please. Uh, in your question five, if you strengthen random to say N random for some value of N, is it still open? Yes, uh, uh, completely. Uh, welcome. <laughs> any end you want, <laughs> any any all. I would like to see uh, instead of a metric result, a result uh, of the form every element of this set is Poisson generic, um, but not trivial. Not every Poisson generic is Poisson generic. Mm. It's meant to be a joke, a bad joke. Um, okay, we go now to yet another new, possibly new um, definition uh, coming from the theory of uniform distribution. It is uh, about not real numbers, but sequences of real numbers. It says that the sequence x1, x2, uh, x3 of reals in the unit interval has the Poissonian pair correlation if it happens, and instead of reading the definition, I will tell you with this little drawing I put here. So it says the following. Suppose you take the first n many elements of your sequence. The bullets are the elements of your sequence. Uh, once you take the n many elements, they will fit in some place in the unit interval. So imagine uh, on the left I have a zero, on the right I have a one. In the sequence, they do not come in order, but once you start painting the unit interval, you will fill um, the unit interval somehow. And now we are looking at and we can read it in order um, of increasing order. Now that you have it this way, let's divide the unit interval in capital N many pieces. Um, you have N many elements. So now you ask, at what distance is 
uh, each neighbor to the left and each neighbor to the right. The Poissonian pair correlation asks that uh, for uh, if you take the piece of length one over n, you should find two neighbors, one over the at the left and one of, at the right. If you take a piece of length one over two n, you should have only one neighbor um, because it is uh, sharing the space like that. So really the definition is as follows. A sequence x1, x2, x3, um, and so on, has Poissonian pair correlation. These are reals now. If it happens that for all positive uh, real numbers S, or you can take rational numbers S, um, if you consider uh, how many uh, pairs uh, are a distance below S over N, uh, you find, and, and you take uh, the proportion of them, you find that this uh, proportion goes to two times S. So if you take S equals one, it says how many pairs are a distance less than one over N? One to the left, one to the right, it will be two. So two times S for S equals one is two. If you take uh, S equals one half, um, then it would be how many pairs, uh, how many pairs are such that they are a distance less than one over two N. So only one of them should be um, a distance less than one over two N according to the definition. So the definition is, yeah, this is the distance to the nearest integer because x, y, x sub i and x sub j are real numbers. So uh, you're not taking the actual distance be between them, but the distance to the nearest integer is more subtle than I said. Um, and, and the result is very nice, so, but only proved lately um, that uh, this property implies equidistribution. Maybe there is a, a question and I'm not listening well. I'm, I'm puzzled by the fact that isn't it simply a matter of taking the entire sequence mod one and that it then becomes the standard distance? Yes, yes. I, if, you, if you take the... the uh, well... You, you have to take it according to the circle rather than to the exactly interval. if you take the sequence mod one and you take the distance in the circle it, this is exactly what you uh, have yeah i agree okay i was puzzled by the way you had captured that notion <laughs> <laughs> yeah well this is in the way it is presented in i copied it actually from uh the way it is presented in the current uh, new papers, uh, this um, 2017 to 2018, where it is proved that this property implies equidistribution. So if a sequence has this property, it is equidistributed in the unit interval. And uh, it was already known from before that uh, if you take the product measure, you find that almost all sequences in the unit interval do have the property. Now, uh, these are for sequences of real numbers, arbitrary real numbers. Um, what examples we have? Not so long time ago, 2015, the sequence of the fractional parts of square root of n for all the n's that are not perfect squares has a property. Then two metric results, Rudnik and Sarnak, 1997, n to the d times x. Like for instance, you fix d, n squared times x uh, for different values of n uh, is you, uh, has a Poissonian pair correlation. Or for other values of d uh, greater than two is also the case. And the kind of sequences that we study most, uh, two to the n times x, uh, has a property for almost all real numbers x. 
uh, also Rudnik and Zadesku. Um, however, there are many uh, sequences that have been proved not to have it. For instance, n times x for all values of n fractional parts fails the Kronecker sequence for every real x. Um, and many of the uh, constructed constants uh, used for normality that have already tried fail the property. Uh, for instance, I, lately I tried one and I found that it, together with Olivier Carton and Ignacio Molio Cunningham, and we found that uh, it does not have it. So for now, there is no easy construction. So here are the obvious questions again. Is there a computable X such that the fractional parts of two to the n times X has Poisson and pair correlation? Um, and the other question is, are all random reals X having uh, the Poisson and pair correlation for the sequence two to the n times X? Um, similar to the questions I had for um, the um, Poisson genericity. Uh, again, in order to answer these questions, it is necessary to effectivize the proof, uh, the proofs given here that almost all, uh, for almost all real Xs, um, the sequence two to the n times X has the property. And the effectivization is not obvious at all. I have one more topic where it will take me one minute and then it will be the end of the talk. Um, there has been a long, um, a lot of nice work on uh, giving the descriptive complexity in the arithmetical hierarchy of properties of real numbers. Uh, following the work of Kekris and the research line of Kekris, Key and Linton 1994 proved that the set of bo Borel normal numbers to base two is pi three complete. This result can be uh, strengthened to prove that if you consider not just base two, but all the bases at the same time, you again obtain the pi three completeness. Um, and if you ask for the set of uh, real numbers that are normal to some base, you obtain sigma zero for completeness. Uh, a nice result uh, asks for the set of bases for which a real number is simply normal, uh, can be simply normal. Simple normality is only counting digits in a given base and not blocks of digits. And we found that there is no other logical types except multiplicative, multiplicative dependence. Um, so, and uh, there are some new results by Marconi, Riemann, Sleiman and Valenti uh, last year showing that the set of real numbers X for which there is a Fourier measure that makes X random is sigma two complete. Um, and two uh, other results, uh, very nice. Airy, Jackson, Mans, and uh, Weidniak. Uh, they prove first uh, a property. So if you have a normal number X to base B and another normal number X, uh, Y to base B, is there addition uh, normal to base B? Well, the set of numbers that preserve normality under addition is pi zero three complete. And uh, if you change the numeration system, something, something we have not talked about in this uh, meeting, um, also you can take Borel complexity for normality for some other numeration systems and they did it lately too. So there's a lot to, uh, that has been done. Possibly there are more results and I have not put them all. I'm sorry for the things I forgot. Uh, and the questions here is for the properties I mentioned that today, Poisson genericity and Poissonian pair correlation, uh, we would like to prove that they are complete in the arithmetical hierarchy too. But I think they are pi zero three complete, but to be seen. Uh, we arrived to a summary of open questions as I promised. I talk about random real numbers and uniform distribution. And I um, mentioned that we do not know exactly 
whether the sequence two to the n times x is already taking care of all the work that the sequence in the effective Volksma class uh, do take care of uh, by asking on uniform distribution, either modulo one or uniform distribution with respect to recursively enumerable sets. For both, uh, we do not know uh, whether it is the same of asking just one sequence or asking a full family. Then I mentioned the open conjecture on X being random for a Fourier positive uh, dimension, a measure based on a Fourier positive dimension um, that that entails that uh, AN times X is uniformly distributed modulo one when AN is a sequence of distinct integers. It's open. Then the questions on whether it happens for all real numbers X that they are Poisson generic or for all real number X uh, are, have Poissonian pair correlation. Then I propose that uh, uh, to examine the possibility of making constructions of computable reals for the two definitions uh, of um, that I mentioned on Poisson genericity and Poisson and pair correlation. Notice that one is for a real number X directly and the other one is for a real number X such that the sequence two to the n times X has the correlation. Then I talk about discrepancy and I ask what is the discrepancy associated to random reals? Does it coincide with the discrepancy are associated to almost all reals? And I believe the answer is yes. Um, also, I ask whether the discrepancy uh, uh, for a random real X uh, that is random with respect to a Fourier measure, what is the classical discrepancy of the sequence B to the N times X for different Bs? Um, and then um, I ask for the descriptive complexity of the mentioned properties. Well, this is a summary of the open questions. And as I said, I will not go into this, which is a lot, but this is, are the references that I used to, uh, for this talk. And the black part is um, references regarding um, computability and uniform distribution. The blue part is references for uniform distribution of sequences, classical and the light blue part is for the property of Poissonian pair correlation and uniform distribution. And this is all I wanted to say. It's uh, three o'clock. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, now we can open it up to questions. If, if uh, anyone has a question, I guess just just unmute yourself and uh, uh, ask away. It's already been numerous questions throughout the talks. So. so if I may. Yeah. Please. Um, you are looking at uh, very various families of rating chess. But uh, do you only consider number systems based on the fixed radius dicks or do you also consider generalizations where, for example, the factorial radix system? I think uh, I my listening was not really good. Maybe, Damir, can you give me a... Uh, I also didn't didn't hear it. Your your audio was a bit okay. breaking up a bit. Can you maybe try again? I'll try again. You are looking at a fixed radix B, but you can also consider number representations where you are using a factorial system. Does the theory extend to such generalizations? Well, for many sequences are um, based on some other um, functions in, 
I try to stick to the simplest thing. And yes, different numeration systems and different forms of uh, sequences are appear in this literature quite often. I have not um, specific results for other numeration systems. Uh, I have not studied uh, that. But yes, they coming to in, in, into the literature, yes. Oh, it might be just future research. Thanks. <laughs>